Hospital Report as pride and dignity stop the new world order. Welcome to her Panmo TV and welcome to this UFO Disclosure 2023 Senate Hearings Part 2. It is uh, just uh, gone, uh, it's 25 to 3 in the afternoon, my time, 25 to 10 uh, US Eastern Time. And, um, well, there is some activity already, if you want to, I'll just show you now. Um, by the way, if you haven't already, please do watch the introduction video, which is part one, which you'll find on my channel just before this one. Um, I, might, I might put a link in the description box, if I can remember. If not, there'll be links to both on the Hapanway radio blog. But anyway, I um, just want to show you what's going on on the page. We have like a... The, it's actually run, it is actually now a feed. It's been running for quite a long time now. It's just 19 minutes 35 on there. Um, now, it just says, as you can see here, United States Senate Committee Hearing Channels. This is not a YouTube video or anything. You, if you like, if you press open in a new window, you just get this. You just get this. I mean, you can just get you can watch you can watch it like on a big screen like that if you like, if you prefer, which is probably better actually. So I could close that there. Um, you've seen that page, and then just watch here. I've got like two windows open there, um, and I'll just hide that. And um, hearing on the mission activities oversight and budget. Hopefully, I think it sorted out the budget, but hearing on the mission activities oversight of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Coverage begins 9.30 a.m. The event starts, as you know, 10 a.m. So just wait it now, I think, to see what happens. Um, I'll let you know as soon as there's some activity. But, uh, let's have a look, here we go. It's due to start 10.30, so there's plenty of time. It's, uh, they did say that it might vary, but if anything, I imagine it. I can't see I can't see them starting early. I mean, if if what, if what another committee starts early, they'll, my guess is they'll probably go and have a coffee, cup of coffee or something, go out and smoke a cigarette or something before starting again. So that's it, guys. I'll be back as soon as there's a point of interest to be back about. Well, hello there, everyone. It's um, now 22 minutes past 10. We're still waiting for the hearing to start. I've just got the screen here. It still says it's... Uh, there's this coverage going on. As you can see, it's still live. I thought we just... Uh, we could watch a bit of Steve on this Witness Citizen thing until then, if you like. Here we go. If I can give it, it'll start. Otherwise, why would they go through that process? I'll just put here. Yeah. Um, they, would, they would know whatever. Hi, everybody. I'm going to put a note in people, a comment in here. I think people forget that, too. Like, if this was all just about balloons and drones, um, that's what they would call it. 15 minutes. <laughs> Barrow. Right. We, yeah. have a, <laughs> we have a special guest, Jay. If, if you want to you do a classic Jay introduction. It's everybody. It's everybody. Here we go. Hi, everybody. A warm... 15 minute greeting from Oxford, UK. There we go. <laughs> Anyone here I know? Let's have a look. Um, you know what? It's, uh, I don't recognize any names. I rec don't recognize any names. I recognize names, any names. Oh, someone called Joss says hi. Oh, cool. Oh, so, yeah. Um, I don't I'll regularly watch this channel. I've watched a couple of their videos. So, uh, and then, uh, then, the, then, then, Hopefully I'll see somebody I know. But right now I'm just um oh, Steve in this and on this particular topic for so many years. It's great to have you here today, Steve. Thanks, gentlemen. I'm happy to be here. This is a uh, Steve, another significant face. step forward uh, to where inevitably we are going, which is going to be disclosure from the United States president. Yeah. It is orderly, oh, hang it on is a appropriate, it involves from the United States president, Steve, are you sure? I know you think so. What we'll learn today will be significant. Will it be what the, the people that want this now want? No, no. We're not going to get anything profound. We're going to get a procedural hearing in which Sean is going to kind of update that very important committee. Daniel Christian I says, think, uh, uh, Oxford, what do they say about UFOs? Um, I'll say here, at Daniel. Apart from me. Oh, hang on. Not a lot, unfortunately. Uh, and so for anybody that is doubting that this is somehow a 
a, a gang, a charade. No, no. This is the government doing what it should have done in 1970 and 47. It could have done it in 1953, particularly yeah. after the extraordinary. About to start soon. I'm watching the live stream. Make sure we don't miss anything. Yeah. The war essentially ended. For the I first am to time, it should have to happened during the Clinton administration, but they just couldn't do it. They shoved it down another what now, twenty uh, th year, thirty years yeah. from nineteen ninety three. Long the time than has that, Steve. The truth embargo is a dead lie walking. It's only a matter of time, and this hearing is just one more Smash step the light, in that process. The light, but most importantly, the thing you want to take away from this hearing as you watch it is that a woman whose star is rising in the Democratic Party, who was a legitimate candidate in a crowded field in the last election, but held up very well, who was almost certainly going to run for president again, because Joe Biden is not going to run again, but he is certainly not <laughs> going to tell you that. He might hobble the again. possible time, because a lame duck president it is, has a much more difficult time getting their agenda pursued, but he will turn, uh, step down. And she will be one of the first. She will be a candidate. And the uh, the irony of all this Trump is that there is an excellent possibility that Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is going to ride a UAP into the White House. And I thought I would never say that. Which should be a disclosure, <laughs> well, pre a disclosure president. Well, I think tr I say Trump. I think is the one more likely. But you know, if it, if I'm wrong on that, fine. I mean, she could be the one. I mean. Uh, President Biden riding a UAP the, uh, yeah. the primary season begins actually before the which would suit her best you think she'd look best in a in a saucer a flying saucer or a uh, tic tac or maybe a, a a flying triangle Senate Intel Committee and other committees soon could easily happen with the next couple of weeks I sure they can call those hearings anytime we know they've interviewed quite a few witnesses including Bob Salas and many mm -hmm. of the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses as well as the pilots that guy Graham Graham he was he was at uh, Blackpool do you remember we met him he appears on my streetcar named Stargate video do you remember I was just watching that video the other day he's a people watching you interview them at the DOD, city staff interviews them to understand what is your testimony, what are you going to present, not telling them what to say, but basically they need to know the basic testimony so they can formulate the right questions. But once they're under oath, they'll say whatever the hell they want. But and the Biden members of the committee be will ask whatever Biden question they want. Be disclosure and so, and, but they want it to be appropriate and professional. He never they want everybody to look out. good. So they interview in advance. That has happened already. I say so I'm expecting hearing him soon. a Once week Bob Salas to say some of these pilots and some of these other nuclear witness object testimonies base. are put under oath in front of a committee such as the Senate Intel with hundreds of millions of people wa wa uh, watching. <coughs> you can just about start counting the days until the President of the United States can can comfortably then go before the American people and say, yeah. "Hey, yeah. I watched it too. I've talked to my key people." We have a non-human intelligence engaging us. I'm so looking forward to learning so much more about that. I mean, that's yeah. what we're missing, right, is mm -hmm. is the testimony from people that are very convicted, like Bob Salas. I mean, or Mario Woods, we've had him on this channel. Like, my my dad actually sent me, he goes, how can <laughs> anyone who listens to that? Steve is always so optimistic, and that's what I love about him serious and real and authentic so once the public hears that stuff yeah i agree with you i think this, uh, you know the, the script will flip i have a pile of the affidavits that i think eight or nine of these fine gentlemen submitted and in, in a put together sure. for a press conference all the way back in 2010 <laughs> they were distributed to the an image of Jilly brown riding ufo it's like dr strange like love and the and the missile and the the, the, the bomb scene you know <laughs> but kiss there was a book, two books. Duck Look at asylum here. It's never going to happen, because fellas. Because that threshold could was not crossed. It, we weren't in a place where people oh, who should be reading those affidavits and bringing oh, those people to DC could little do it. Face. That threshold was crossed in December of 2017. And the only reason they are they haven't already been testifying in front of Congress is because a lot of strange and rather unpleasant things have happened since december of 2017. it's a complicated world a dangerous world and so uh, it slowed it down but by 
when you consider the truth embargo in its 70th year, the sixth year, uh, five years, and all the things we've seen, I'll take that. Now, I won't, I'm not getting any younger, so let's get it done. Yeah, <laughs> okay? Yeah, and we have to get it done this year. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, that, tragic that, that, I'm see happy it. with it the really case. Was. I'm happy with this happening. I ask people to be patient. Yeah. And, 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 and again, I also ask them, this is the time, not for I told you so's, more than, almost as much as I'd want to see disclosure, I'd like to see Steve seeing disclosure. I really would. It would just be so cool. He'd be overjoyed. Single member of Congress that's raised their hand and, and asked a question and wanted to do something. Tell them how wonderful they are. I assure you, they really like to hear that, and they really like to tell other people in the, in the Congress how how well they're being received. Yeah, I really like that. Actually, uh, on the other show, on a show I did a couple of days ago, I actually repeated that message because I heard you say that. And I think that's great. And if you treat people with kindness and, you know, and respect and gratitude, maybe somebody else will see that and go. I want some of that, too. Maybe I'll start getting in on the UAP thing, you know. So I, I think that's a great message. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I'm curious. Um from 2017 until now, how do you feel the this process has gone? Do you feel like there is anything that could have, have been done better, or is everything pretty smooth? What's your take? <laughs> That's like saying, you know, how do you feel about this war? It lasted five <laughs> years. You know. Yeah, 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 anything right, good I question. That's, there. that's, a, that's like, an interesting uh, thing. I can, I, I can I keep my own post. Said, nah, let's this. just don't charge up that hill side this by side and get slaughtered. No, this is a paradigm shift. Portions. It, it is the result. It is following seventy-five years. One of the most extraordinary things the government of any country has ever done, which is somehow truth embargo or embargo a reality. It's flying over. Some of Daniel Elizondo assassinate people and, and round up. Ask him any relation. Uh, it, it's a, it, so the idea that it was going to get resolved easily, no. Uh, and, and and given all the the entities and agencies, and <laughs> Daniel Elizondo, one of his past and present, was it going to be not messy? Of course, it was going to be messy. Alien Awkward, girl, I know alien girl. Yes, uh, Steve Bassett in the house. Yeah. What isn't? Right, so pick something else that isn't. Right, let's talk about our our uh, our exit from Afghanistan. Didn't go smoothly. These are this is history. These are big things. But if they continue in a reasonable, orderly way, and if people do what What's is this? right, and, and they right. start I've got three. focusing on authenticity I've got three extra and instead of right. BS and manipulation, if we will. Get to where we have to go, and not okay, so and I that. encourage people don't focus on this. There's on this thing and screw I think up, that's it now, uh, isn't it? Yeah. or jump on every debunking item that gets. Uh, uh, I, I, it's going to happen. Get yourself up at thirty thousand feet, right, and look down on the process from Alien there. Alien girl has her own have channel. Have a cool drink with you, okay? Mm, not the pilot, just good. you, and and try to see everything from that perspective and see the larger picture unfolding. When you do that, a lot of the anxiety falls away, and it's easier to, to see what I'm seeing, which is we're heading for disclosure, yeah. and hopefully, and very likely, before the political season begins for the 2024 election. They do not want to have this issue still hanging out as, as uh, at several hundred people start to run for the presidency. That will be a mess. On the other hand, if disclosure has happened and that issue is now worldwide accepted and in play, a fact, then every one of the politicians can speak to it in a thoughtful and orderly way uh, without having to put any Expect BS the unexpected out and, shock and, right, and yeah. be able to speak to what is a nonpartisan issue so that people won't be laughing at them. They'll go, oh, that's a, I think you're a complete idiot, sir. But boy, what you're saying you about UAP issue, that materials. makes sense. I kind of like you. Why don't yeah. you talk that way about everything else? Like so that's my take. Disclosure this year before the uh, campaign season begins. Now, hey. now, one interesting thing about that, that's great to hear, Steve. I, I appreciate your optimism. I always appreciate your optimism. And, um, you know, I mean, one, one thing here is that, sleeping. you know, yeah. it, well, it, some of us are white. People think about the disclosure process and the process of, of revealing more information to the general public, at least for, as far as like the U.S. military, the government is concerned. You know, you know, if we're going to ignore 
everything that's happening in academia, everything that's happening in like the VC world and new technologies and things like that. And if we're just squarely focused on DC, you know, there is the aspect where even within DC, we have these differing factions, right? We've got the DOD and they seem to be like <laughs> running interference all the time. You know, we've been dealing with the Arrow office that is kind of like mm. under the auspices of DOD, who has been, you know, frankly, like, I don't want to use the word, but have been like blocking you know, the process uh, in, in, a large, chat, in a large form way Brian for many Bach, years. Brian. And here oh, we have Brian this representative Ibach. and we're going to be hearing from him in the public for the first time in a way. And we're wondering Brian, like what kind me. of cards is he's going to play, right? Because he's been hearing from Bob Salas. I'm he's not. been hearing from these other people. And we also Leo, know no, um, from the New York Times, from the work of Leslie I'm Kane, not. Ralph Blumenthal, <laughs> and others that, that people like Eric Davis, people like Bob Salas and others have been also giving testimony to other people besides Sean Kirkpatrick. <laughs> exactly what so I'm do you think say. that there's an element here where we're going to hear from Sean Kirkpatrick and we're going to be wondering, you know, is this a step in the process where it's not smooth sailing, but it's a guy who's going to be painting himself <laughs> into a corner for the benefit of other people? Okay, would you, I don't think so. You First like of all, let's be careful of language. Some they haven't Nigerian testified to goals. They've given briefings on the Hill. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine now. how many members of Congress now have gotten a, 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 a classified briefing. It's a lot. All the top committees, the armed services, the intel, and so forth. And, of course, they're now you know, chatting it up with some of their colleagues and friends in the lunchroom and whatever. It's spreading shape. through Congress. But they've gotten briefings. I think pretty harmless, we know though. that many witnesses have been, taking up on, been taken up on the Hill by Christopher Mellon and some others to, quote, brief them brief members of Congress, not testify to them, all right? To give them <laughs> background information. All of these politicians right now, even Smash the that ones that are, have, have no connection to this issue Sean, in public um, way, is, is are all, songs, among said, other things. So, Sean has some good songs, Sean Rash. He sings a song called Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's about UFOs and things. Issue. What are we going to do? Some of them are going right at it. And the classic example is uh, uh, Congressman Tim Burchett. You cannot yes. get in front of too many microphones and say, the extraterrestrials are here and we have crash technology, <clears throat> which happens to be true. Uh, and you have to give him credit for that. He, he sees that as a belt, and that's good. And, and what Tim is doing is like an icebreaker. He's making it easier for others to come forward with more <clears throat> moderate statements. But testimony is about sitting in front of a hearing Table, taking the American oath, expression. We say oh, all yeah. answering questions about your your knowledge and history on this issue to a member of the House or Senate with millions of people watching. That is a whole different thing, and that has not happened. And that's not Kirkpatrick's job. His job is to come on there and tell us what Bob Salas has told. <clears throat> all of that is the pre-hearing work. His job is to bring attention to what Arrow is doing. To satisfy is that, as I said earlier, that Congress the is demands kicking that ass now. she and others included in those they two finally extraordinary are. pieces of legislation, the NDAA 2022-2023 Act, which is just unprecedented, right? A lot of people just take that for granted. Oh, don't we don't we write legislation like that all the time? No, we don't. Right? And and essentially do the show show the flag, do the right thing. Is she going to press him and try to put him in a corner? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. He will say the kinds of things you would expect from the head of a new department as to what is going on. Now, the light. there are other members on that committee, right, besides Joe Brennan, who the could light. ask John Nine anything minutes. they want. Now, these kinds of committees at that level, such as the subcommittees of the Armed Services uh, <clears throat> Committee, as well as the Intel Committee, <clears throat> these are members who, by and large, are pretty disciplined. They don't, they don't get that, wild right? and crazy. These are serious committees involving the national national defense and what have you. And so I don't expect too much. But just, just to give you a taste of what could happen, let us go back to the hearing from Moultrie and Bray, uh, led by Andre Carson, when another member of Congress who has made a decision that, I, I got this, by the name of Mike Gallagher. Oh, he was in As the, we yeah, he the was, end um, of that hearing, Mike Gallagher. deliberately, and with intent, he was in the house here last year, wasn't he? Two things, just out of nowhere. Oh, look at this! Uh, nothing. Do you know anything about Very the, funny. 
nuclear weapons things that have happened. Uh, just asking. And well, Trey we'll wasn't here to talk about he that. He, he, wasn't the, he wasn't even that formal head of anything. Uh, he was like an interim guy. Hi, and he was just a, basically an Indian, had to say, well, like, we don't know. And naturally, poem, he took a lot Indian. of grief over that. I feel sorry for the guy. <clears throat> but then, uh, Allegor wasn't done. He then turns and hands to Carson. Uh, I would like to put the Wilson what Davis to start, someone's asking. into yeah. the Crescent record. All right. So let's just say that something like that could happen. One of the members mm. of the uh, Armed Services Subcommittee could just decide to turn to Gillibrand. And by the way, I, <clears throat> I have these documents about this and such British and such, and I'm going to put record. So is that a good thing or a bad for thing? For a I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, I, I think it's not likely to happen, but it could happen. But the most oh, important the, thing, Brian uh, Ivac says, watching me to doing the closed door first is that when a is hearing like this happens, right. it's not just we had a hearing, something was said, we move on. This hearing is a message that is sent to every single member of the House and Senate and all of the Senate staff, as well as the White House staff. It is a message sent to all the lieutenant colonels and colonels in the DOD. All right, this is real. It is happening. You need to start getting on board. You need to start taking it seriously if you haven't yet. All right, your future with the D, uh, the Department of Defense, or your future as a member of Congress may depend on how you handle this issue. And they're basically saying what I've heard in the words: the, the most the profound sports. event in human history is taking I should say place. Disclosure. How do you want to be seen and respected? Wouldn't you vote for the disclosure history? supporters? Do you want to make a fool of yourself? He's right. Do you want to continue to hang on to the truth embargo until the last dog dies? Or do you want to get in the truth business? Oh, in a tube in says another Senate hearing is still finishing up. This possible? Right. That message is being sent in a number of ways. And oh, everyone loves Steve Mr. Bassett. You're just awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm wondering, like, from everybody. <laughs> here if you don't want me wondering just like what do you think given that this is a relatively procedural hearing that's going to be kind of the first update in a way from arrow in front of the subcommittee in terms of like this office recently being stood up or standing up or however you phrase it right like how like what is the most wow, significant damn. data point because we heard from um, people like Chris Mellon, we've heard uh, from Sean, you know, online on Twitter, getting getting questions, strategy, strategic questions from folks online and from uh, thought leaders in the field in terms of like what can be asked I still use and what paper, can be you know. answered in this hearing that could be the most revealing piece of data um, that could possibly happen at That's this stage of the game enemy. where we are today in 2023. What do you guys think? That's a great question and, and hard to answer without having the data yourself, right? But I, I would, what I would uh, ask is something along the lines of, do you, do you have any data that shows um, objects being transmedium, moving from space to the atmosphere to water or vice versa? I think that would be a great question to, to ask because all he has to simply do is say yes and and that puts it on a different course you know but and he can say yes but i can't share with you the actual data because of you know the, the what it was captured on is, is classified so i think that would be fantastic um uh, you know but i'm also very impatient so you can just go in and say <laughs> i actual, hope you didn't show up today without the body it's marsh gas yeah. because if you did we're wasting our freaking time <laughs> you know but uh, and i also think it would be appropriate to follow up on things like wilson davis documents because they were asked about in the last hearing and put in the congressional record i think that would be appropriate or even maelstrom uh, to follow up on yes, that Roswell. but they probably have their own agenda because they're a different committee so events roswell like events. what would be appropriate is for Bob Salas to sit at a hearing table. Yeah, Bob Rose Salas. And discuss that event. He's already yeah. done the press uh, What would be appropriate is for any of the witnesses with respect to do that, not Sean Kirkpatrick. He, he to, the, to the extent that he speaks, Will Davis and Wilson should Show be the ones discussing it in the front of the hearing yeah. under oath. And one of the See reasons the that's, that's important, <clears throat> forgive me. <clears throat> 
Yeah. When Sean Kirkpatrick at that level can mention Bob Salas or any of these other things, he's putting these people on the spot. Such a terrific asset. They're not oh, in a position to testify. It. There's no Steve, formal you process, have your and he's fans. just kind of throwing it out there. What, what, what? You know, uh, Wilson or Davis is going to have the press try to come at them. And what, what, what do you want? That's not the way you want to do this. And so he's not going to talk that way. He's going to give her an update on the funding situation, the scope of the cross agency committee, how much is already in place. All right. Mm. He may give say, listen, a, Steve gives a, a me hope. summary of the data that's coming in it's and how successful they are of organizing that process. Hope. All right. But it will be notable that if one of the other members of the committee with their own agenda asks yeah, the house hearing could get rowdy, bring in Wilson like, and Davis. And here's a question that might be answered and, and should be asked. I think. Dr. Kopat, it has been mentioned in a number of news articles that witnesses such as uh, former SAC base officers have been pre-interviewed or interviewed by Arrow. Why have you done that? Is that in anticipation of hearings taking place? Oh, listen up. Right? They're late because uh, so another forth. session is going on. Right. Uh, that would be a, 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 a pretty significant question that uh, is appropriate to ask. And the answer is yes, we are interviewing them. We would like to have uh, note what they are. Oh, what, what, what anyone kind of the movie? No. They may have. And she may ask, were those hearings in preparation say, for, yep. uh, were those uh, <laughs> interviews in preparation for hearings before, you know, I reviewed some no. congressional committees? That would be a good question, a legitimate question. And all he has to do is say yes. And boy, the light in a lot of reporters' eyes is going to suddenly go on, and they're going to, oh, you mean, yeah, we are going to have those hearings? So if I'm Chilibrand, I would ask the questions that tips off the American people and the rest of the Congress that, yeah, there are hearings coming. You, you didn't think they weren't, were you? So look for that. Something like that. Is it, is it a game playing? Not exactly. It is appropriate to the process. Right. I'm say we're we're dealing with important matters. Right? A lot of people's careers are involved. Like Agencies, uh, reputations are involved. Uh, even though there has been a truth embargo it's for some of the years, we, we're, we're irritated by that. It. That doesn't mean didn't like it, it the end of the truth embargo. Yeah. It's got to be, you know, like the French Revolution, right? With people running up and down the streets and creating Wasn't barricades as as and cutting out of off them. heads and stuff. No, 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 no. Uh, it needs to be orderly, but it does need to be expeditious that would be the logical next step though wouldn't it be steve it would actually be getting witnesses on record under oath sure. saying what you know rather than this kind of drip feed that we've had for, for decades now where yeah, sharp, they're interviewed didn't like by it, it was very slow and, uh, it was very um, slow paced, magazines yeah. and in books etc but nothing formal nothing that you can actually you know sort of hang something over them and say look is this definitely true what you're saying so they're actually on the record and under oath and then it becomes a much formal process, and then you can also go just, to the Air Force just as well. You know, guys, so you can get um, them to come on the record. Nope, it's not about UFOs. It's, well. a, it's more a cryptozoology film. It's, it's a case of, this from, flying from objects is actually some it's kind of creature. It's a case of us versus them, if you like. And it's one side saying, yeah, this exists, and then the Air Force come along and say, well, no, it doesn't. You know, how, where, what's the Air Force's um, involvement going forward from this point? Are they still going to just stonewall it? Or are, is, are they undermined by people coming forward and going on the record? You know, how much weight do you give witness statements under oath when you've got you know, decades of U.S. Misleading. Air Force kind of um, just denial, basically? Well, first of all, it is not the job it's of the Air Force or the Navy uh, or UFO any other service to, quote, deliver the goods. Crypto. No, no way, right? There are so many reasons why that's not going to happen. That's not their job. Those are there is only one person that can end this embargo and essentially declassify oh, the fundamental says, Here we go. as the president of the United States. Nobody else Stop winding me is up. in Here we go. position of authority. And so the Air Force and the Navy oh, have got just to left. sit back and wait to be told oh, what to do. Now, they oh, have participated oh, in some things. All right, They have been asked to do some things, and they have done them. But the idea that they're going to be aggressive about it or act on their own, no, no. And the fact that they, they have been complicit in the truth embargo going back to 
the 60s and 50s. That's ancient history. Uh, Most of the people that were doing asking, that are do dead. Think, all right. Uh, do you so think now you have a new crop of individuals when, when who are going to be uh, uh, saddled, not saddled, not saddled, saddled but as they're as going to be required as well as one of their, discuss, their, say, uh, their jobs, one of the things that we'll, they'll look back on in their career is that I was part of the process that think? finally ended the embargo on this Hopefully, truth, and we got it out to the American people. And then after know. that, we went through a somewhat complicated process in which information oh, was give the president some ice cream and revealing information <laughs> disclosure small d took place in which more and more Questions knowledge in the government now hands try, was provided to the American the people in an orderly way. fashion Never right, the authority to without try violating national security but under some pressure that's a good uh, question. And, and some disagreement, meaning, well, yeah. we want more. We want this now. Well, we can't give you this now, and so forth. They'll be part of that. They will be yeah. part of a paradigm shift and a like that process one. that I'm sure they will be very proud of. This is what is happening. And so you have to kind of put the past in the rearview mirror for now. All right. The, 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 the process of ending the truth embargo is not relitigating every abuse of power and every mistake that was made for 70 years. It is the process in the moment of getting the right people in front of the right commission, testimony under oath, which will then be uh, thoroughly vetted by the, the journalists and, and the media, which will then spread that information out uh, and, and, and lead somewhere. Right. The, well, this this is not about, chance. well, we need to have a hearing and then we can move on to the other nonsense that we deal with. No, this is leading somewhere. It has to lead somewhere. I don't, so I don't the the hearings, which were probably these even guys more can earn some money than what these doing what they do. went on Good. Good for them. were incredibly complicated, but riveting. Making smart. <laughs> Weren't just being done. So they had something to I've do. got up late. What did I miss? They had a specific goal. Will the president of the United States be forced to resign and or be impeached and, and forced to resign or not? And ultimately, it achieved that outcome. It got to a place where the testimony under oath before hundreds of millions of people clearly showed that the president Nixon had, how would you say, done egregious things. And he made the decision to resign. And that's fine. That was a big negative, oh, right? Sean's back. That was a negative thing. Question One of the things that people Will, don't understand or forget about what's going on Will now, this isn't a big negative. This is a massive to positive. Truth and it's a Those small, hearings about Nixon were painful and brutal. And I think refrigerate might be the wrong word. Because all it was about was getting rid of a president. That's right? Robo 76. And that was going to be a pain. And then you're going to have uh, Ford having to decide whether to pardon him, which he did, and that ended his political career. All negative. This is about finally revealing to the entire world that you're not the only advanced species and John civilization Burris. in a galaxy with 500 billion planets. All right? John Burris and lawsuit. So, wow. Has that's not a negative. That's a really a common cool thing. law precedent. Right? And so that is one of the reasons why once this thing gets going, it's going to accelerate it's going to accelerate because it is a powerfully important thing and everybody's going to be a winner who gets on the right side of this uh, and 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 i want people to think about it that way i mean and it's not not going to be a process in which yes we get disclosure but along the way we eviscerate all those awful people that did not tell us the truth not even the, even if they're dead, they're going to destroy their legacy. And also, John crap. Burroughs no. was the okay. Randolph Forest witness it, it, who went to it, court it, it, it's over the injury he suffered. And it's ir irritating that it has taken 75 years. But I would like to point out that one of the greatest uh, movements of the 20th century, which is the civil rights movement, took from 1875 to 1964 before it achieved the fundamental goal it had to get, which was the Civil Rights Act. And boy, a lot of people made a lot of sacrifice. Many never lived to see the outcome. It was tough, it was brutal, it was complicated, but it succeeded, all right? So the fact that this process These is now things do seven, take a long time, don't they? Old, I think there's a lot of civil rights activists yeah. who go, you know, you know, walk it off, dude. <laughs> you know, buckle up, right? You, you're getting off easy. 
right? It's 75 the years. The wheels of the law and, and government turn very slowly. It's going they to be so important slowly. and extraordinary for the entire world that, uh, hey, oh, come, come. Uh, you should be, it's you momentarily. Should be grateful. This is the, the movement and the activist mo- uh, oh, they've changed it. you made. They've changed it. It's now momentarily. Coverage begins momentarily. All right. Come. Cool. Is being resolved. That road is not over yet. Uh, and so I try to be understanding and I try to uh, you know let people know, hey, look, an activist movement, 76 years on, it's it's coming in. Rejoice and tell people how, how good you feel and tell everybody in, in Congress and the government and, and the DOD how pleased you are that they're doing the oh, right Oh, Christina thing. Gomez is doing a stream too. I, the, the, my, my one beef, so to speak, is uh, leaving out the past. How can you really leave out the past and have any sort of disclosure because it's so thick and rich? I just don't know how you can do that. And doesn't the past and all those well-documented cases further cement the reality oh, Gerardo, yeah. of the situation? No, no. Doesn't that bolster the truth of it? You don't leave out the past. The past is going to happen today. So that's where we need to alien. leave out the past as we go that's through this final one. phase, as we get to right. the disclosure event. The things alien. that have to happen right. that Last make rights. it possible for the president From to go the before the American creature. people uh, with a minimum of political uh, political political and confirm the ET presence. That's what's going on. And so the past needs to be deferred. But as I said, you divide things up into three things, the pre-disclosure world, the disclosure event, and the post-disclosure world. There are things that can be dealt so with. Just, that just sprung to mind because I've just written an article for UFO Truth yet. Magazine now, about this subject. Perfect about, example um, is the contact issue. Aliens the contact issue is not going to be in front of this, the committee hearings as we move towards disclosure from the president. But post-disclosure, the house of cards is falling, when this thing is baby. now accepted back by everyone the academics god bless them the journalists the politicians the general public it's a fact it's a given now let's look at the past shout out to you for jesus yeah. there. I put, let's this is acknowledge the heroes the house of and cards the people is falling, that carry baby. the water let's talk about what went wrong let's talk about how it could have been done differently let's resolve Hmm, Van Bush. Yep, and the cover was started yes, by Van Bush. is going to get vetted. It must go back further than that because there's evidence of a cover-up at Aurora, War. 1897. Almost all of them have been written after the Civil War ended, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands oh, of books so written about baby. truth embargo, the 76-year history, the end of the embargo, I can't the disclosure process, it. And of course, as the well, post disclosure world, really certainly the first few years. Uh, I won't be around to read those books, but I know they're coming. And so, again, it is um, 30 minutes late. Look what they are, yeah. Relax, lazy, understand what's going on. Okay, this ain't momentarily you get it done. But if you're going to try to get the entire 70, previous I hope to flute today, years uh, through uh, that same door. No, say, you can't get it through that door. Not yet. You have to have a little patience here. It's, that's wonderful to hear. I, 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 I think your your, your framing, your context is really key here. You know, one thing away, you know, I see people commenting in the chat about uh, when are we starting up here? What's going on here? One thing to mention is that it was part of the schedule from the get go that the closed door hearing was actually going to happen before the open. Been. Now that's unlike what happened see. last time. Well, with the closed door hearing is about the, the UAP House congressional case, our House congressional uh, hearing last year. Um, we kept hearing, uh, you know, questions and answers that I were like, "Okay, that. let's put that off. Uh, we'll save that for the closed door." Because the closed mm-hmm. door, in this situation, you know, with this particular group of people, you know, we have other prominent senators that are going to be going up uh, into the into the open hearing. Now, what do we think might be happening uh, in this closed door hearing that why would they why would they put the cart before the horse and wanting to hear the confidential before the open hearing? And is there anything that, you know, with these group of professional people who are used to hearing secrets all the time, is there anything that we can gain in this open hearing that might give us context for what might have happened in the closed door hearing? 
Well, that's very very important. Hopefully, one of them will forget. Ask. Look, um, the the fact that they're holding, uh, and, I, and assuming that is the case. I mean, I, I don't, I haven't had that sent to me, but whatever. I, I'm assuming it's true. The fact that they're holding a closed, closed hearing before this is a sign of how important it is. Hmm. The hearing with Moultrie and Bray wasn't that big a deal, right? Carson was kind of acting. Andre Carson, who is a, is a fine a cigarette bright. <laughs> I think this was a case where. Well, seriously, uh, maybe they do need. I said that maybe they do the, need to have the a house, break. the committee chairs and subcommittee chairs were watching all this stuff happening in the Senate, and they were going, "Well, you know, we're not potted plants down here. All right, the house is kind of important too. Why aren't we house, involved?" Yes, I refer your question this, of the closed right? session. And so he, yeah. I think, made a decision. They hey, can't say we're I'm saving gonna, it for the closed I, session now, can they? They're doing the closed and I session can hold first. A I didn't and know I that. I thought it was another subject. To come in, didn't know it was right? the UAP. So it was, how would you say, a little more like that? And so, and he was able to do that. But under the circumstances, a a pre pre closed door thing was not in play. And one of the reasons we know it wasn't in play is I think if they had a closed door hearing and, and, and worked out all the parameters in advance, I don't think Gallagher would have made that move and brought in the Wilson Davis notes and the, oh, uh, the nuclear get weapons get back to the foyer. <laughs> Can we just that was the hearing, see why this hearing is late? later. <laughs> this, this matter is far more serious. Yeah, John, Arrow John Green being World, set yeah. up. Uh, there has been a lot that has happened. And so the closed door hearing ahead of this is a sign just, of how why, much with more a, serious with this a is public hearing and how much more serious. Why not just patient. disseminate a press Meaning, release? Look, let's find out what we're going to discuss. Don't know. Let's get our, our, our uh, ducks in a row. Uh, let's uh, make sure Maybe that them down. Uh, we don't get off into the woods uh, and so forth. Uh, in other words, let's maximize the the hearing and 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 let's do it right okay mm. now that's that's a good sign all right uh again let me give a pretty example they they know that that some of the nuclear witnesses i hope daniel's wrong here it's, it's late because it's harder to right? prepare for lies and they probably the would like to talk with sean no, ahead of time true. about sean look uh yeah it's probably not it's not appropriate that we go there uh, these hearings are preliminary to, to, to congressional hearings. And so we're not going to ask you about that. Now, he can say, thank you, fine, that's, we'll do whatever. In other words, just kind of getting on the same page. Is this, is this public relations? A little bit. But it's also about making the progress, the process work. Not doing stuff that's going to create political blowback or other issues. It's about doing it right, and it's perfectly legal, all right? So now, does that mean that a member of one, one of the members of the committee, having gone through the pre, uh, uh, the, the, the private- Derek King uh, says, maybe disclosure may not actually time, work out be decides, quite well, the same narrative that this guy's I'm asking this. Are you physical I'm presence. gonna ask about this, well, that's what I'm gonna do. Someone said earlier, expect the it. unexpected. Right? There is and a physical do, presence though, I mean, they leave footprints, right. these things. But all I can take away is this. They it's, not, debris, it's not an effort to objects. somehow well, at the same time they have this uh, it, but rather them. to do it right. Is that a contradiction? And to make sure they're not violating any any uh, understandings, agreements, NDAs, whatever. Uh, so this is a serious hearing, and that is an indication that it is serious. And understand, there have been a whole bunch of private, uh, non-public briefings over the last four years. Come More on. than we know. Slow bastards. Uh, the number of actual events and the number of people that have actually heard something the number of times is is large. Why? Because this thing is that big. All right. It's that big, but it's unlike most any other issue that they've ever dealt with in their careers. It's huge, but it is it is on the back end of a 75 year process in which the government said there's nothing here. So you see their dilemma? It's like it's like Trying to have hearings about the nuclear weapons situation, meaning let's have a hearing and talk to the right people about where is that going and what are we going to do about non-proliferation. Uh, but after a 50-year period in which the government had been denying, we don't have, have any nuclear weapons. There's no nuclear weapons. No, there's no there's no bunkers out there with weapons. What are you talking about? You see how much more awkward that would be. That's what they're dealing with. All right. 
and it's a problem they created for themselves. But to be fair, most of the people sitting on these committees, UK they, didn't, uh, they, didn't, they didn't create this embargo, they didn't found it, and weren't that involved in maintaining I'm not gonna, it, I'm not but go it's to now so their now. thing. And they're the ones I was going to tell them about the fact that the government was embarrassed because they weren't supposed yeah, to store engine new. I think um, they're <laughs> taking so long in the closed hearing, probably because they're watching our commentary <laughs> for, <laughs> as far as what they're going to be talking about. So Absolutely. Yeah. With that in mind, let me ask you, Mr. Bassett, how do you see a disclosure affecting um, just mankind in general? How do you think things will change? What's your view of the post-disclosure world, so to speak? Very simple question. Thank you for asking it. I, I don't I think anyone a really knows. Response to that. <laughs> that is a question that's very difficult to answer. I mean, I tried to answer it in, in my books. I'll say more later. No one knows yeah. how the post-disclosure world is going to go. And it starts the day after the words come out of, of, uh, of uh, President yes, Biden's totally. mouth. Unless they come out of Xi Jinping's mouth or... Uh, Vladimir Putin's mouth first, but whoever head of state's mouth, that's I'll when it begins. It I begins trust them one before I trust Biden. After that. Look. Well, I'll Our use an analogy that I've used many times. Food. If you've heard it, forgive me. But I'll say I really amen, like it. amen, yes. It's the Not opposite the of the Newtonian food, yeah. version. Not that dropping I'm a, a pebble into a perfectly a still pond. Conventionally religious man. We've seen that in slow motion. <laughs> right, it's very cool. So you see the thing coming down in slow motion and it hits the pond, and these waves immediately start emanating in all directions and they start spreading out in this wonderful pattern and they go off in the distance. <laughs> and the it's delayed like, because Congress in a cool. frenzy deciding which bathroom is The post disclosure <laughs> world is going to be the exact opposite of that. Physically impossible, but the metaphor stands up. What do I mean? Disclosure will be this fairly large pebble being dropped into the calm ocean that is human civilization. I joke, but whatever. Post disclosure. And we'll roll, watch it in slow motion and it hits that ocean, that ocean of civilization. But it doesn't generate big waves that go off in all directions and dissipate. Someone's being Oddly pessimistic, enough, yeah. And against the you know physics. I'll it say generates here. small waves, just little waves. It starts I'll say here. Out. And it's as they better. watch them spread further and further from the event, they get bigger and be bigger an and optimist bigger and bigger. Than bigger. Than like tsunamis, pessimist. that when they finally if arrive at the coast and things get shallow, they rise up and they kill everybody. You're but that's, that's wrong. not what's going to happen. So what am I saying? You I'm feel saying that the day after the closure, not much is but going to change. If you're ninety-nine percent of all the people in the world's lives, ninety-nine point nine will be exactly the same. And they will have to do exactly the same. Their wrong. problems will be the same. Their their joys, their expectations, the whatever. They're going to have to deal with it. Maybe they'll get a day off. I don't know. Oh, but mostly, it's exactly the same. But I'm running then, out of space. As that paradigm shift I'm starts to yell the in the minds of eight billion people including people that run things and have a lot of power and influence. You miss it out on the fun. Kind of work its way in it's it's better to be an optimist than a pessimist. If you're an optimist and you're proved wrong, you feel disappointed. And of course, as we if you're a pessimist and you're proved wrong, you miss uh, out on the fun. Of technology. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? The it's know, true. And when it's coming out and, and so forth, it's going to start changing the world in bigger and bigger ways. Yes, the force comes back from time. that pebble So change. that... Mm. 10 to 15 years after the disclosure event, the world is going to be profoundly different. Profoundly different. So we could spend days and months trying to itemize each little change, right? Oh, starting. Okay. Uh, but we don't have days or months. Dr. Shanko, so oh, here, we go, go, here, go. here and in today's right. earlier closed session. Ready to go. And for his long okay. and distinguished career. Okay, here we go. Right. The hearing come will come on. to order. I'd first like to thank our witness, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, for testifying here and in today's earlier okay, closed session, and for his long and distinguished career in complex both in the intelligence community and, and the other challenging Dr. Technical is the director of the So we appreciate the willingness of Dr. Kirkpatrick to lean in on this brand. issue and the work that he has I'm accomplished thus see. far. And we look 
look forward to the statement as presentation yeah, of good. examples of the work Arrow has done. In late 2017, media reports surfaced about activities set in motion by the late long-serving Majority Leader Senator Harry Reid more than a decade ago. We learned that there was strong evidence of advanced technology reflected in the features and performance characteristics of many objects observed by our highly, highly trained service members operating top-of-the-line military equipment. We learned that for the, at least eight, the past eight years, military pilots frequently encountered unknown objects in controlled airspace off both the east and west coast across the continental United States in test and training areas and ranges. We don't know where they, are, they come from, who made them, or how they operate. As former Deputy Secretary of Defense David Norquist observed, had any of these objects had the label made in China, there would be an uproar in the government and media. There would be no stone unturned and no effort spared to find out what we were dealing with. We can look at the recent incursion of the unidentified PRC high altitude. And shoot me, I can hit pause and just start as again. an example. Yeah. Because, and but because of the UFO stigma, the response has been irresponsibly anemic and slow. Congress established Arrow. We made it clear that we expect vigorous action. We added very substantial. Yes, but that's because there's a truth embargo. Mrs. Gillibrand, I don't know if she understands that. Well, initial funding for the office, but despite our best efforts, the president's budget for fiscal years 23 and 24 requested only enough funding to defray the operating expenses of Aero. It included almost no funds to sustain the critical research and development necessary to support a serious investigation. It took a letter to Secretary Austin from Senator Rubio and me and 14 other senators to get the office temporary Let's go down for a the bit. current fiscal year. In this hearing, I tend to probe a series of specific issues. In the recent incidents where multiple objects were shot down over North America, it seemed that Pentagon leadership did not turn to Aero Office to play a leading role in advising the combatant commander. We need to know whether this will continue. We need to know whether the leadership in DOD will bring Aero into the decision-making. Well, maybe that's because Arrow's like Project Blue Book. It's designed to be a smokescreen when the real thing's going on behind the scenes. They're taking orders from other people, Kirsten process in a visible way and we need to know what role Arrow will play in interagency coordination after the NSC working group disbands. In the fiscal year 2023 National Defense and Intelligence Authorization Act, Congress established a direct reporting chain from the Arrow Director to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. The role of the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security is limited to providing administrative support. We need to know how this direction is being implemented. <clears throat> UAP are frequently observed flying in extremely high or very low speeds and come in various sizes and shapes. During the recent shootdowns over North America, DOD disclo disclosed that filters on radar systems were adjusted to allow for detection and tracking of diverse sets of objects for the first time. While opening the aperture can overload the real-time analytic process, we cannot keep turning a blind eye to surveillance data that is critical to detecting and tracking UAP. We need to know whether Dr. Kirkpatrick can achieve the necessary control over sensor filters and the storage and access to raw surveillance data to find UAP anomalies. Finally, yeah, one of the cool. tasks Congress set for Aero is serving as an open door for witnesses of UAP events that's or participants bit, yeah. in government activities related to UAPs to come forward securely and disclose what they know without fear of retribution for any yes. possible violations that's of her amendment. signed non-disclosure agreements. Congress mandated that Aero set up a publicly discoverable and accessible process for safe disclosure. While we know that Aero has already conducted a significant number of interviews, many referred by Congress, we need to set up a public process that that and we need to know where that effort stands. With that, I'd like to turn to Senator Ernst for her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Kirkpatrick, for your testimony today. Uh, I'll keep these remarks very brief so that we have maximum it's time for your briefing. Uh, the recent downing of the Chinese surveillance, surveillance balloon and three other objects underscores the need match. for domain awareness. Adversaries like China and Russia are working to hold there's US a stars and stripes, and there's this one here. At risk. Which That's is, why your testimony is so. I don't know what that is. Important. Can't see. Is it, is it the so look Canadian flag? To a progress update on the establishment of your office. Is it Canadian? As members know, your office evolved from the Navy-led Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force to the All Domain Anomalous Resolution Office, known as Aero. Dr. Kirkpatrick, she missed out AIMSOL. Background in science and Probably technology, she can't pronounce research it, what it and development for. and space makes you well suited to discuss these emerging challenges. My priority is that we understand the full range of threats posed by our adversaries in all domains. That is what the joint force needs to be prepared to fight and win in defense of our nation. 
This committee needs to know about Chinese or Russian advanced technology programs to exploit our vulnerabilities. And it needs to know uh, whether your office, Morgan. along with the IC, has detected you see, she's doing the same Chinese thing that Jilla branded on that news program. Or attack us. She is Finally, we need to saying, ensure China, Russia, China, Russia, she's going around the pothole. Multiple elements of the DOD and IC own no, a piece of If you're going to get to the alien mission. side, you've got to, to go around that. To add value, Arrow's efforts cannot be redundant with others. Um, thank you again. We look forward to your testimony. Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, you can give your testimony. So I'm just gathering some screenshots. Thank you, Chairwoman Gilbrand, the, uh, uh, Ranking Member Ernst, distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's a privilege to be here today to testify on the defense, uh, defense's efforts to address unidentified anomalous phenomena. First, I want to thank Congress for its extensive and continued partnership as the department works to better understand and respond to UAP. So I'm just getting some screenshots for uh, the screenshots for the Unidentified titles. objects in any domain pose potential risks to safety and security, particularly from military personnel and capabilities. Congress and DOD agree that UAP cannot remain unexamined or unaddressed. We are grateful for sustained well, congressional for engagement years, on this issue, which paved the way for the DOD's <laughs> establishment of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in July of last year. Though Aero is still a young office, the spotlight on UAP in recent months underscores the importance of its work and the need for UAP to be taken seriously as a matter of national security. All leadership that I've had the pleasure of working with whether DOD, IC, DOE, civil, scientific, or industrial, view Congress as a critical in partner in this endeavor. Like, um... Arrow has accomplished much Are these just in the members of the public that are allowed in? It was established. I bet the Steve's there. More than no, 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 Steve can't experts. because he's on that live stream. He's organized around four functional areas, operations, scientific research, integrated analysis, and strategic Oh, alien scientist was going to go there. He was... In the nine months since yeah. Arrow's establishment, we've taken important steps to involve and improve Not establishment, uh, Sean. Collection, Name change. Standardize the department's UAP internal reporting requirements, and implement a framework for rigorous scientific and intelligence analysis, allowing us to resolve cases in a systematic and prioritized manner. Let's see what comments I've got on the Meanwhile, screen. consistent with legislative direction, Arrow is also carefully reviewing and researching the U.S. government's UAP-related historical record. Oh, alien scientists Arrow is, is there. leading a focused effort to better characterize, understand, and attribute UAP. Oh, that's We'll with priority later. given to UAP reports by DOD and IC personnel in or near areas of national security importance. DOD fully appreciates the eagerness from many quarters, especially here in Congress and in the American public, to quickly resolve every UAP encountered across the globe from the distant past through today. It's important to note, however, distant past. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence. Remember, they pushed it back two years. No explanation why. Successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military personnel, specifically Navy and Air Force pilots. The law establishing Arrow is ambitious, and it will take time to realize the full mission. We cannot answer decades of questions about UAP all at once, but we must begin somewhere. Well, I assure you that error You can begin with the evidence you already have, including the decisive forensic I evidence. Ask for your patience as DOD first prioritizes safety and security of our military personnel and installations in all domains. It's, it's a bit boring at the moment, just UAP reading their prepared statements. Later on, it will become more spontaneous. And then, like last time, the nation's the most advanced hearing. sensors are those UAP most likely to be resolved by my office, <laughs> assuming the data can be collected. If Arrow succeeds in first improving the ability of military personnel to quickly and confidently resolve UAP they encounter, I believe that in time we will have greatly advanced the capability of the entire United States government, including its civilian agencies, to resolve UAP. However, it would be naive to believe that the resolution of all UAP can be solely accomplished by the DOD and IC alone. We will need to prioritize collection and leverage authorities for monitoring all domains within the continental United States. Arrow's ultimate success will require partnerships with the interagency, industry partners, academia, and the scientific community, as well as the public. Arrow is partnering with the services, intelligence, civilian community, ufologists, DOE, you mean. Well civil partners, and across the U.S. government to tap into the resources of the interagency. 
The UAP challenge is more an operational and scientific issue than it is an intelligence issue. No, it's a political As such, challenge. We are working with industry, it's academia, and challenge. scientific community, which bring their own resources, <clears throat> ideas, and expertise to this challenging problem set. Robust collaboration and peer review across a broad range of partners will promote greater objectivity and transparency in the study of UAP. I want to underscore today that only a very small percentage of UAP reports display signatures that could reasonably be described as anomalous. The majority of unidentified objects reported to Aero demonstrate mundane characteristics of balloons, unmanned aerial systems, clutter, natural phenomena, or other... I think it was 176 out of 200, wasn't it? While a large That's number a of cases in That's our holdings remain technically unresolved, Bill Nelson said it was something out of 700. Of data associated with those cases. Without sufficient data, we are unable to reach defendable conclusions uh, that meet the high yeah. scientific standards we set for resolution. And I will not close a case that I cannot defend the conclusions of. I recognize that this answer is unsatisfying to those who in good faith assume that what they see with their eyes, with their cameras, and with their radars is incontrovertible evidence of extraordinary characteristics and performance. Yet time and again, with sufficient scientific quality data, it is fact that UAP often, but not always, resolve into readily explainable sources. Humans are subject to deception and illusions. He's fighting for his job. He's scared. He's, he's scared. Functions and in some right cases, now, I think. intentional interference. Because he, he's getting to the handful he, of he could get the tin tack level of any scrutiny minute. is the he knows that. Era. that is not to say that UAP once resolved are no longer of national security interest, however. On the contrary, learning that a UAP isn't of exotic origin, but is instead just a quadcopter or a balloon leads to the question of who is operating that quadcopter and to what purpose. The answers to those questions will inform potential national security. It's heavily armed fighters and their pilots. Arrow and warships with missiles and torpedoes can't tell the difference, I swear. I will never, I'll never fly again or get on a ship in my life. Well, when previously unknown objects are successfully identified, it is Arrow's role to quickly and efficiently hand off such readily explainable objects to the intelligence, law enforcement, or operational safety communities for further analysis and appropriate action. Yeah, they did that. In other words, Arrow's mission is to turn UAP into SEP, somebody else's problem. <laughs> well, they, and they the did U.S. government, SEP, the they? DOD, and the IC in particular, those have people, the, op the separation, the safety people, they testified the previously the at the hearing in 2001. Event, the interagency is working to better integrate and share information to address identifiable stratospheric objects, but that is not all arrows lane. Hmm. Meanwhile, for the, oh, by the way, before I forget, domains, I'm going to do something on Hanlo TV for that do demonstrate potentially anomalous the, characteristics. Arrow exists for the 10 year the anniversary of the hearing. Interagency resolve those anomalous cases. In doing so, Arrow is approaching these cases with the highest level of objectivity and analytic rigor. This includes physically testing and employing modeling and simulation to validate our analyses and underlying theories, then peer reviewing those results within the U.S. government, industry partners, and appropriately cleared academic institutions before reaching any conclusions. I should also state clearly for the record that in our research, Arrow has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. Male, in the cow, sufficient excrement, data you know it. Ever attained, that a UAP encountered can only be explained by extraterrestrial origin. We are committed to working with our interagency partners at NASA to appropriately inform U.S. government's leadership of its findings. For those few cases that have leaked to the public previously and subsequently commented on by the U.S. government, I encourage those who hold alternative theories or views to submit your research to credible peer-reviewed scientific journals. Yeah, like you Arrow <laughs> is working very hard to do the same. That is how science works, not by blog or social media. Is he having a go? We know that there is tremendous bullshit by blog or social media. You cheeky bastard! Answers from Arrow. He's having a go at Avi Loeb now. Nature, the UAP and people like has me. for decades lent itself to mystery, sensationalism, and even conspiracy. Oh, for that reason, Arrow remains committed to transparency, theory. accountability, and to sharing as much with the American public as we can, 
consistent with our Don't obligation. Don't tell me, Arrow is safe and effective. Not only intelligence sources and methods, but U.S. and allied capabilities. <laughs> However, Arrow's <laughs> work will take time if we are committed to do it right. It means adhering to the scientific method and the highest standards of research integrity. It means being methodical and scrupulous. It means withholding judgment in favor of evidence. It means following the data where it leads, wherever it leads. It means establishing scientific yeah, peer so review. come along and say, no, you can't talk about data. that. And Arrow is committed to all of those standards. I'm proud of Arrow's progress over the last yeah, nine so months. So Project Blue Book much until uh, Jay Arn Heine blew the whistle on the way. Thank you for your continued support. And before we turn to questions, I'm going to walk you the through continue, some of continued our support, you sure? and a couple of cases that we've prepared. I said, so one of um, the things that Arrow does Co is Congress is finally getting some teeth. integrity analysis, as I've said. This chart represents the trend analysis of all the cases in U Arrow's holdings right to date. What you'll see on the left is a histogram of all of our reported sightings as a function of altitude. Altitudes. So most on, of balloons. our sightings the occur in the 15 to 25,000 foot range. And that is ultimately because that's where a lot of our aircraft are. That's altitude, right? That's um, altitude levels. On the levels. far right upper corner, you'll see a breakout of the morphologies of all of the UAP that are reported. Oh, oh my God. Over half, <laughs> about 52% of what's being reported this. to us are round orb spheres. And almost others. The rest of those look, break look out this. into all kinds Oval of different other polygon, shapes. Tic -tac. The gray box is... Uh, Rectangle Essentially, there's no disc. data on what its shape is. Either it wasn't reported or the uh, sensor did not collect. My God. The bottom uh, map well, is a heat map of all reporting areas across the globe right, that we is, have available sure. This us. is fascinating. <coughs> what you'll notice is that there is a heavy, what we call, collection bias, both in altitude and in geographic location. This is what that's was censored from the, from the first UAP report. That's where Remember our training the ranges box. are, that's where our operational ranges are, that's where all of our platforms are. So it seems to be lying in the Gulf. In the middle, now. what we and have you, done is reduce the, Gulf the most typically reported UAP in, characteristics to here, these uh, the, fields. The Japanese sea. Mostly Ooh. round, mostly one to four Look meters, white, silver, translucent, metallic, 10,000 to 30,000 feet with apparent velocities from stationary to Mach 2. Whoa. No thermal exhausts usually detected. We get intermittent radar returns, we get intermittent radio returns, oh, well. and we get intermittent thermal signatures. But no evidence That's what we're looking for. There's no evidence they're they're, 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 they're built is. by humans, are they? Next slide. These are built by humans. You're seriously telling me that? So I'm going to walk you through two cases that we've uh, declassified recently. Um, this first one is an MQ-9 in the Middle East. Observing that blow up, in which Middle is East. an apparent spherical object via EO sensors. Oh, this is not thing from IR. Iraq, is it? If you want to go ahead and click that. I mean, we saw on the last slide that there was like a big, there seems to be You'll a big it, thing on uh, the. Come through the top of the screen. There it goes. And then the camera will slew to follow it. You'll see it pop in and out of the field of view there. This is essentially all of the data we have associated with this event from That's some years ago. Hell. That's not that thing. That it is going to be virtually Jeremy impossible Corbell's to thing, fully identify. Was that, that thing on Jeremy Corbell's? Just based off of that video. Now, what we can do and what we are doing. We did see there was like a big, there seems to be a big, a large number of sightings in the Persian Gulf area. Did you remember that map? To see and there was what that are the photo similarities published the on across all of these. Do we see these in a particular distribution? There was that photo published on the um, same or not? With Jeremy Corbell published. As we published. get more data, we will be able to go back and look at these in a fuller context. Oh, Mick West! I can't wait for Mick West to see this. How are this. we going to get more data? We are working with the joint staff to issue Very guidance nice. to all the services and commands Just double -check that will then again. establish. Yes, what are the reporting requirements, the timeliness, and all of the data that is required to be delivered to us and retained okay. on all of the, the associated sensors? Uh, sphere. 
an that orb. historically hasn't been the case, and wow. it's been happenstance that data has been orb. collected. <sighs> Next slide. This particular uh, event, South Asia MQ-9, uh, looking at another MQ-9, and what's highlighted there in saucer. that red circle is an object that flies through the screen. Unlike the previous one, this one actually shows some history, really interesting idea, things guys. that everyone thought was truly anomalous to start with. First of all, it's a high-speed object that's flying in the field of regard of two MQ-9s. Second, it appears to have this uh, trail behind it. Potentially anomalous atmosphere. Right, which, wake. at first blush, you would think that looks like a propulsion trail. In reality, uh, if you want to play the first slide, we'll show you what that looks like in real time, the first video. So we're looking at that. There it goes. Why don't you play it again and then pause it halfway through? Right there. All right, you, yeah, you might be able to see there. that trail there behind it. It's a cavitation. Of... That's actually not a real trail. That is a sensor artifact. Oh, right. Um, uh, each one of those little blobs is actually a representation of the object as it's moving through. And later in the video, as the, as the uh, camera slews, the object, that though? trail actually follows the direction of the camera, not the direction of the object. We pulled these apart frame by frame. We were able to demonstrate that that is essentially a readout uh, overlap of the we image. Got a, it's, a, it's a shadow we image. Got a screenshot right? It's not there. real. I'll use these in the time. Further, if you later um, follow this all the way to end, it starts to resolve itself into that blob that's in that picture in the top left, right? And if you squint, it looks like an aircraft because it actually turns out to be an aircraft. Go ahead and put that Whoa. on. Like so you'll see the tail sort of pop out there. And so what you're looking at is, this is in the infrared, this oh, is yeah, the heat yeah, signature off now, of the tail. engines of a commuter aircraft that happened to be flying in the vicinity of where those two MQ-9s Oh, you went. tease. You Why bloody tease. Yeah. So the first one that I showed you, we don't have resolved yet, right? That is an unresolved case we are still studying. This one we can resolve but this is the kind of data that we have to work with and the type of analysis that we have to do which can be you've made quite your point sean you have to but i'm more interested in what you can't resolve frame by you frame. can that was teasing us there further wasn't it? we're now matching all of this with the models of all of those imaging sensors so that i can say i can recreate this i can actually show how the sensor is going to respond all of these sensors don't necessarily respond the way you think they do, especially out in the world and in the field. And I believe that's all I have, and I will open it up for your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirkpatrick. Um, can you just give us some raw numbers of how many uh, UAPs you've analyzed, how many have been resolved, yeah, and sort of in what buckets, and then how many figures, are still left you? to be resolved? Just she was given different figures. Remember, 176 January unresolved, 200, report, whatever where it was, it was 366 or something, and about 150 were were um, balloons, and about two dozen were drones. You know, just uh, give us an update if you have yeah, one. Sure. So as of this week, uh, we are tracking over a total of 650 cases. Oh, 650 now, now is it? Uh, the it's report in January basically said about half of the ones at that time, about 150, were balloon, were likely balloon-like or something like that. That doesn't mean they're resolved. 600. Oh, I see. Okay, so what, uh, let me, when we walk everyone through what our analytic process looks like, we have a, essentially a five-step process, right? So we have, we get our cases in with all the data. We create a case uh, for that uh, event. My team does a preliminary scrub of all of those cases as they come in just to sort out, do we have any information that says this is in one of those likely categories? It's likely a balloon, it's likely a balloon, you know, a bird, it's likely some other object or we don't know. Then we prioritize those based off of where they are. Are they attached to a national security area? 
does it show some anomalous um i see so if something's outside a national security area it becomes less your concern it's a spherical thing that's floating around well i suppose that's fair enough that's fair enough and it has no payload leave it for the civilian ufologist less important than something that has a payload on it which would be less important than something that's maneuvering all right so a, right? a structure so there's, in other there's words sort of a hierarchy of just binning the priorities because we can't do all of them at once <clears throat> Once we do that and we prioritize them, we take that package of data in that case, and I have set up two teams. Uh, think of this as a red team, blue team, or a competitive analysis. I have an intelligence well, give me a job, team. Mate. Give me a job. Take me on. Intelligence analysts. And I have an S&T team made up of scientists and engineers and the people that actually build a lot of these sensors or physicists. And a couple of hospital porters, surely. Can do anything, right? Um, and... But they're not associated with the uh, intel community. They're, they're not intel officers. So they, they look at this through the lens of the sensor of the, the, what the data says. We give that package to both teams. The intelligence community is going to look at it through the lens of the intelligence record and, and what they assess and their intel tradecraft, which they have very specific rules and regulations on how they do that. Scientific community, technical community is going to look at it through the lens of what is the data telling me? What is the sensor doing? What would I expect a sensor response to be? And back that out. Those two groups give us their answers. We then adjudicate. If they agree, then I am more likely to close that case if they agree on what it is. If they disagree, we will have an adjudication. We'll bring them together. I need you we'll to write report and close cases. We'll that line from Project the Project. Why Green do book, you say one TV thing series? Say I need we you to write reports and close case, cases. Uh, a recommendation. That'll get written up by my team. That then goes to a senior technical advisory group, which is outside of all of those people, made up of senior technical folks and, and uh, um, intel analysts and operators from retired uh, out of the community. Uh, and they they essentially peer review what that case recommendation is. They write their recommendations. That comes back to me. I review it. We make a determination, and I'll sign off one way or the other. And then that will go out as the, I'll the show case you more of this later, determination. But know, um... Once we have an approved web portal to hang the unclassified stuff, we will de you know we will downgrade and declassify things and put it out there. In the meantime, we're putting a lot of these Alien on our is there, classified the web portal yeah. where we can then collaborate with the rest see. of the community so they can see what's going on. I'll show you more of that later. That's, in a nutshell, that is the process. Um, right. So, I'll show you more of that uh, later, but Alien Scientist is there. Because of that, that takes time. So of those over 650, you know, we've prioritized <clears throat> about... Uh, half of them to be of, of um, anomalous, interesting value. Anomalous, interesting And now we value. have to go through those and go, how much do I have actual data for? Give me a one in chat. All I have is, is an operator life. report that says, I saw X, Y, or Z, a, I, v, my assessment is value. A, B, or C. That's not really sufficient. That's a good place to start, but I have to have data i have to have radar data i have to have eo data i have to have thermal data i have to have overhead data and we need to look at all that does overhead mean spy planes now, satellites from a big picture perspective i still have that's all very, still very valuable data and we're looking at applying a lot of things new tools uh, analytic tools like natural language processing so i can go across all of those reports and look for commonalities how many of them are being described as round spherical objects that are maneuvering how many of them are not maneuvering how many of them seem to have a plume to it or no that's also going to be very valuable to give us more of a global picture and a trends analysis of what are we seeing and help us get to the determination so go back to your question ma'am we have um uh, this next quarterly report will be coming out here pretty soon. Our next annual report, um, you all have uh, given us, uh, moved it up to, to June, July. We're going to be having that done about uh, that time frame, and we will have a 
we'll be combining a whole number of reports in, into that one. Uh, I think we'll, we're currently sitting at around, hmm, if I remember correctly, we're around 20 to 30-ish are about halfway through that analytic process. A handful of them have made it all the way out to the other side, gone through peer review. We've got case closure reports done and signed. We're going to get faster as we get more people on board uh, and we Give get me a more job. of the community <laughs> I'll do it. tools to automate some of the analysis. You need a hospital porter on the team. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And Dr. Kirkpatrick, the ODNI annual threat assessment states that China's space activities are designed to erode U.S. influence across military, technological, economic, and diplomatic spheres. Likewise, Russia will remain a key space competitor. In the course of your work, have you become aware of any Chinese or Russia technical advancements to surveil or attack U.S. interests? So that's a great question. No, it's a, Part of it's what we have to question. do as we go through these, um, especially the ones that show it's gonna be, it's gonna be boring. signatures of advanced technical capabilities, is determine if there is a foreign nexus. Oh, no, maybe it's not. That's yeah, really it's hard be. if what we observe doesn't have a Chinese or Russian flag on the side of it. <laughs> now, like it's the, uh... I think it is... Um, Prudent to say, he's blushing slightly. Of the of the cases that are showing, it, you know, some sort of advanced <laughs> technical signature, of which we're talking single percentages of the entire population of cases we have. Mm. Um, I am concerned about say it. what that nexus is, Aliens. and I have indicators that some are related to foreign capabilities. We have to investigate that with our IC partners. And as we get evidence to support that, that gets then handed off to the appropriate IC agency to investigate. Again, it becomes an SEP at that point. Yeah, somebody Someone else's else problem. problem. Right. Very good. Thank but is, you. Do you notice yes, his, it, is it, <laughs> is you notice it, his awkwardness is it there? Is it possible that down. the Chinese or Russian advanced Moultrie technologies and Bray were doing could, the same last could time. be causing some of these anomalous behaviors? And and you said there seems to be um, some indicators. Uh, so just for us today, straight, uh, could you describe potential threat that might exist out there if they are born sure. nexus. In order to do this research appropriately, we have to uh, also be cognizant of what is the state of the art and development across the S&T community. What is, what are the DARPAs of the world doing? What are our, what's the horizon the scanning of, of emerging technologies appropriate to this subcommittee? What is happening out there? What he's trying, what, if somebody could, what he's, he's speaking very awkward about is that how would that these are itself and what would it look these like? Are, do those this signatures match capabilities that are not known about. Um, there are in any human emerging capabilities out there that that, in many instances, Russia and China, well, China in particular, are on par or ahead of us in some areas. Well, anti-gravity? Right. So previously I used to be the Defense Department's mm -hmm. intelligence officer for science and technical intelligence. That was our job. Um, and then, you know, several years ago in Space Command doing space. The, the, the adversary is not waiting. They are advancing and they're advancing quickly. If I were to put on some of my old hats, I would tell you they are less risk averse at technical advancement than we are. Mm. Right? They are just willing to try things and see if it works. Are there capabilities that could be employed against us in both an ISR and a weapons fashion? Absolutely. Do I have evidence that they're doing it in these cases? No, but I have concerning indicators. You're Thank just you. trying to avoid I aliens. That. And that's 
That is why it's so important that you are working with the intelligence community as well, Mm -hmm. Um, because you you have the science, the data background, but you also need to know um, from various sources what adversaries may be working on. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, thank you, Chair Gillibrand, Ranking Saint Member Ernst. There, there he is. is a really important Do you hearing. see him on the right? I'd like to thank you, Dr. Dr. Kirkpatrick, for your service to the country. And as a former systems analyst myself, I really appreciate uh, your flowchart, the description of the process, and particularly the trends analysis going forward, how that's going to help us. And you talked about language, the large LLMs, the large language models, artificial intelligence. That's really going to help us in the hunt forward Mm -hmm. predictive analysis, I think, uh, um, uh, to some of your point, Mm -hmm. what we're Mm -hmm. worried about. But I want to focus on Nevada because uh, I want to talk about the impact of UAPs on aviation safety. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to unidentified unidentified aerial phenomena, phenomena, excuse me, one of my first concerns is really about the safety of Nevada's military aviator. So we have airmen stationed at Nellis Air Force Base, Mm -hmm. naval aviators flying at Naval Air Station Fallon, and service members across from across the world training at the Nevada Test and Training Range. I know you know all this. And unfortunately, the existence of advanced UAPs in the U.S. airspace and over U.S. Nevada military Test and Training Range, oh, that's not Area 51. Um, that's not still a Groom Lake test site, I think. The it's Navy's called, officially acknowledged that between 2004 and 2021, 11 near misses occurred involving UAPs that required pilot action and follow-up reports. Bloody As a result, in 2019, yeah. the Navy established a protocol for pilots to report on their dangerous encounters. So could you speak to any ongoing efforts within DOD to ensure the safety of our aviators with a potential um, UAP encounter? And what's your relationship with NORTHCOM, NORAD, SPACECOM when it comes to this immediate real-time response and how they're they're, they're right there in the moment, right? Absolutely. That's a great question. So uh, let me start with, um, you know, my relationship with the commands are, are, are are very good. Like I just came back from uh, sitting down with with General Van Herc and all the all the J staff. Ah, oh, General Van Herc, uh, yes. A couple weeks ago, talking through exactly what we need to do. To the guy, the most honest guy in the object gate. Uh, we are also working very closely with Joint Staff, and the Joint Staff has has just been very outstanding in helping uh, work through policy and guidance issues to the forces and to the services. The, and I would like to just make sure that we we message back to all of the operators the importance of their uh, reporting and the fact that you're about to get a you know a bunch of new requirements that we're issuing through the joint staff on all of the data that we're going to need you to save and and report back to us. Um, it is invaluable, uh, and we are working to try to to take the most advantage of that to learn what it is that we're trying to mitigate. To get directly to your question, first thing that we're doing is normalizing our reporting, right? We're standardizing our reporting and the requirements associated with that. Uh, guidance from the joint staff, I think, goes out maybe this week, um, maybe next week, uh, that we've been working with them for some months that does exactly what I just said. It's, it gives them timelines. It gives them requirements. It gives them, here's all the data you have to have, um, and you got to retain it. The next thing that comes after that is a plan ord that will go out to the commands for mitigation and response. So there's a couple of things that we have to do. One, I need to uh, work with uh, the commands and with the IC and with uh, our outside of our DOD and IC partners to extend our collection posture Mm -hmm. targeted at some of these key areas that you saw on that heat map. Uh, that have a lot of activity so that we can turn on extra collection when an operator sees something. So part of this is generating uh, as a response function, what we call a tactic technique and procedure for an operator when he sees something, calls back to the operations floor, they can turn on additional collection. What does that collection look like? How do I bring all that together so I can get more data on what is that thing? Can, can I ask really quickly, do sure. you 
have the authorities you need to extend your collection posture between agencies or, or uh, branches of the military? Because that seems to me to uh, maybe be a sticking point. I know my time's just about up. I'd love to follow up about your risk management methodologies yep. for some of these. But do you ha need any authorities that you don't have to uh, get, get the data? There are some authorities that we need. We currently are operating under Title Ten authorities, but we have... Um, you know, good relationships across the other agencies, but having additional authorities for collection tasks. So it's a very, it's a very, it's a very pro feminist committee. They're all women. They're all women. I'm sending any men. Dr. Kirkpatrick, will you help us write that language so we can put it in the defense bill this year so that we know what authorities you need? Mm -hmm. okay. We can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to start second round. So if you want to stay, you can ask another round. I have at least three more questions. So. Do, do you want to do you want to go right now? So you, in case you have to leave. Yeah, go ahead. Mrs. Rosen, speak up. Oh, no, our mic's gone. Mrs. Rosen's mic has been switched off. Spy balloon. It did cross through the U.S. airspace, shot down by a Sidewinder missile fired from an F-22. Sidewinders cost us close to half a million dollars each. So given the cost of these missiles, the cost per flight, all of these other things, like I said, follow up on the authorities, your methodologies, the data collection, they can help us in other ways. But how do you think we can develop a sustainable, affordable response to UAPs where we need to um, that may, that will definitely violate our airspace, not may, <laughs> definitely violate our airspace every chance mm -hmm. that they can get oh, because cool. there are adversaries and they want this information so what do you think some cost effective measures might be that we can um get what we need shame my mic was off because she, is she talking about object gate or the balloon measure is just the balloon so that that is actually wrapped into the plan or that we're working with joint staff to send out what do the commands need from both a capabilities perspective for kinetic and non-kinetic yeah. engagements what are the response functions of the of the uh, particular wings or or navy, uh, what have you? And then, what authorities do they need? So one of the one of the challenges that we've seen is is you know there's an authorities issues with the with the owners operators of those ranges that they need to work through, and we're working that with uh, joint staff and, and OSD. So. Big picture, we need to do all that. If you want to get down to the specifics for, you know, there are non-kinetic options to engage pretty much everything. Kinetic, uh, kinetic just means shooting them down. warfare, whether it's, you know, laser technology. That's where this data comes. Having right. the good data collection, predictive Correct. analytics. Lasers, pew, 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 pew. In space wars. Make some assumptions on possibilities. That's right. And we will inform uh, recommendations back to the department on, Here's what could work. Here's what I'm, I'm say, work. I, I do have Here's trouble following this bureaucratic Thank language. You so Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate so, um, it. Thank but I'll do my much. best. Um, can, you can I always rewatch like this. Talk a little bit about your logistics, who you report to, how that's going, uh, whether you need different reporting lines. Um, by congressional legislation, your office is administratively located with the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, but you're not substantively subordinate to the Undersecretary. Rather, you are a direct report to the Deputy Secretary. Are you taking direction directly from the Deputy Secretary? Are you able to meet and brief the Deputy Secretary? Um, is the Office of USD INS um, working with you to have the right framework? So USD INS... Uh and the, uh, I, I currently report to USDINS um, until they come up with the, the plan for how they're going to implement legislation. DOD and DNI are working through that now. I'd have to refer you back to USDINS on what their plan is. Um, Do I need to update your reporting structure in the next defense bill, or is this something that you think will work its way out, or does it need further clarity? I think they're planning on coming back to you with an answer on what that plan is. And mm -hmm. I they're just talking about the organizational structure of Arrow now. What you want to do. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, Congress has mandated that your office establish a discoverable and accessible electronic method for potential witnesses of UAP incidents and potential participants in government UAP-related activities to contact your office and tell their stories. 
Hey, yeah. Congress also set up a process whereby people uh, subject to non-disclosure agreements, preventing them from disclosing what they may have witnessed or participated yes. in, could tell you ah, what yes. they know without risk of retribution from, or amendment. violation of their NDAs. Um, have you submitted yes. a public-facing website product for approval to your superiors, and how long has it been under review? Yes, click here if you did Roswell. I have. Uh, we submitted the first version of that uh, before Christmas. Where is it? Dot, dot co, dot and do you Where have an estimate from them when they will respond and when you'll have feedback on that? What's the URL? Okay. We will author a letter asking for that timely response um, <clears throat> to your superiors. Uh, when when do you expect that you will establish a public-facing discoverable um, and access portal for people to use to contact your office as the law requires? How long does it take to set up a web page? So yeah. I would like to first say this thank was you a all very much point, remember? for um, referring the witnesses that you have thus far to us. I appreciate that. We've brought in uh, nearly two dozen so far. It's been, it's been very uh, helpful. I'd ask that you continue to do that until we have an approved plan. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a multi-phased approach for doing that, that we've been- uh, He's taking uh, orders from someone else. Socializing and have submitted for uh, approval sometime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and once that happens, then we should be able to push all that out and get, uh, get this a little more automated. Great. Um, what I would ask, though, is as you all continue to uh, refer to us and uh, refer witnesses to us, I'd, I'd appreciate if you do that. Um, please try to prioritize the ones that you want to do, because we do have a small uh, you know, research staff yep. dealing with that. That was Thank one you. of her, um, that was one of her sticking any, points. Uh, plans for public engagement that you want to share now that you think it's important that the public knows what the plan is? We got a sorcerer in the hangar. Well, we have a uh, uh, sorcerer in the hangar. A number of public engagement uh, <sighs> recommendations, uh, according to our strategic plan, um, all of those have been submitted for approval. They have to be approved by USDINS. Um, we are waiting for approval to go do that. Okay, I will follow up on that. Um, and then my last question is about. Um, <clears throat> the integration of departments uap operations research analysis and strategic communications um during the recent uap incidents over north america it didn't appear that you were allowed to play that role um do you agree that the public perception is generally that you and your office did not appear to play a major role in the department's response to the detection of objects over north america uh what can you tell us um, well i didn't see him at the press conference did you perspective we saw general and von Herk. In the after action assessment process is there awareness that there is a need to operate differently in the future and a commitment to doing so when the when the objects were first detected i got called by joint staff leadership uh, to come in uh, late one night to review uh, events as they were unfo unfolding and to give them a, a, you know, an assessment uh, based on what we knew at that time. Uh, I did that, uh, worked with uh, the director of joint staff, the J2 and the J3 uh, that night and over the couple of following days on what are the types of things that we are tracking from an unidentified object perspective? What databases do we use? Those sorts of things for, for, norm, for known objects, known tracking. Um, beyond that, the response, I would, have to, I would have to refer you back to the White House for the decision on how they did the, the response. Uh, we did not play a role in anything. what you would respond other than that initial um, you know, advice on what we are seeing and how we are seeing. That could be symptomatic of the Thank split within Madam the administration Chair. I talked about. Um, There's hardly anyone Dr. there. Patrick, I, I know that your office has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. And of course, any new agency, there tends to be a push to increase size and, and funding. Um, we want to make sure that you're able to meet your goals. But what I also need to ensure is that we're not duplicating or replicating existing functions um, and creating redundancy within DOD and uh, the interagency. So what steps are you taking right now to make sure that your particular <sighs> office and function is, is unique? 
uh, to any of the other agencies that might be involved in these types of cases? Change its name again. That's a great question. So I would like to um, lay down, here's, here's what am I, you know, sort of my mission and my goal and my vision here. So the vision is at, at one point, at some point in the future, you should not need an arrow. If I'm successful in what I'm doing, we should be able to normalize everything that we're doing into existing processes, functions, agencies, and organizations. Post and make that part world. of their mission and their role. Right now, the niche that we form is really going after the unknowns. If you, I think you articulated it early on. This is a hunt mission for what might somebody be doing in our backyard that we don't know. Mm. All right. Well, that 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 is what we are doing, right? But at some point, we should be able to normalize that. That's why it's so important the work we're doing with joint staff to normalize that into uh, DOD policy and guidance. We are bringing in all of our interagency partners. So NASA is providing a, a liaison for us. I have FBI liaison, I have OSI liaison, I have service liaisons. The IC, half of my staff come from the IC, half of my staff come from uh, other scientific and technical backgrounds. I have DOE. Uh, and so what it's we're trying to do is ensure, again, as I, make UAP into SEP, they get handed off to the people that that is their mission to go do so that we aren't duplicating that. I'm not going to go chase the Chinese high altitude balloon, for example. That's not my job. It's not an unknown and it's not anomalous anymore. Now it goes over to them. Right. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I wanted just to uh, follow up on the filters for surveillance. Um, outside observers have speculated that DOD sets filters on certain sensors to eliminate objects that are moving really fast or slow because what we are looking for militarily are conventional aircraft and missiles. UAP do that doesn't fit into these programs would thereby be weeded out and never noticed. This specula speculation was proven to be true during the UAP incidents over North America where DOD publicly acknowledged that we were able to start seeing these UAPs only when we opened up these filters. Um, obviously, our military oh, operators cannot be overloaded with objects that are not conventional aircraft or missiles. That is supposedly the explanation sure for object the object being captured They just became more sensitive because that process balloon. That your office knows what's really out there. And is that going to cost money? Will you expect to pay for that money out of Arrow's budget? One of the key tenets that we're trying to do in our science plan is understand what those signatures are. So we get all the raw, for example, radar data prior to the scrubbing and filtering to allow it to enter into our weapon systems and our detection systems. We are now taking all that data and cross-correlating it to what pilots are saying they're seeing or other observations from other operators. What that allows us to do is then see if there are any, any signatures in that data that I can pull out, generate uh, what we'll call automatic target recognition algorithms that allow us to then use that signature associated with a observed UAP, whatever that UAP may be. We will then make those recommendations of what those changes should be back to the department. So the deputy secretary had asked me last uh, October to that's simply identifying UAP. What changes do we need to make to radars? Types, I think he's to, talking about uh, platforms, to <coughs> detection systems, and algorithms to to pull on those those algorithms. So if you get a certain uh, that's going to take some time. That's where you get it again. You'll know it's the time. same sort of objects. It's not, it's not instantaneous. Right now, a lot of the, I won't say, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the things that fall outside of the ranges of those filters have been identified by people in the loop. And you can't have people in the loop all the time. You can, you know, it's just not cost effective. So part of our budget is working through what, is, what does that look like? and then making those recommendations back to the big program offices for them to put into changes in acquisition. My last question is about the academic community. Um, 
Can you give us an update on sort of how you collaborate with the academic community and uh, whether um, how the independent study being done by NASA complements Arrow's work? Sure. Two questions, so I'm going to try to make it quick. The uh, 1979, Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary <laughs> evidence. Oh, don't. I would go one step further, and I would say extraordinary claims require not only extraordinary evidence, but extraordinary science. And so how do you do that? You do that with the scientific Posa. method, right? And so as Arrow is developing and implementing its science plan, it has to do so grounded in a solid foundation of scientific theory across the entire range of hypotheses that have been presented for what UAP are. That range spans adversary breakthrough technology on one hand, known objects and phenomena in the middle, all the way to the extreme theories of extraterrestrials. Hey. All of that <laughs> has physics-based signatures associated with it, mm, whether it's extreme, theoretical though. from the academic community, known from things like hypersonic weapons. Avi Loeb said Urbu was probably extraterrestrial. Uh, adversary breakthrough. Right. That's not extreme. As we've talked about before. Or the known objects that we have to go measure. The idea is across that entire range, you have to come up with peer-reviewed scientific basis for all of it. The academic community plays a very big role on the Don't tell me he's about to say spectrum. known unknowns the and intelligence community unknown on unknowns. the other end of the spectrum. If he wants to be and really unoriginal, that's unknown. what he's going to say. Once I have those signatures identified in, in validated, peer-reviewed um, documents, then I have something to point to for all that data. Because all that data is going to match one of those signatures. Right? And then I can go, well, it's that and not that or it's that, and that helps us go through all that. Where NASA comes in and, and the, the study that they're doing, which I'm uh, supporting, is really um, looking at the unclassified data sources that might be used to augment our classified data sources to understand if there's a signature there we can pull on. So very similar to the radars, mm. but civil capabilities. So for example, we have a lot of climate science satellites, for example, that look at Earth, lots of them. How many of those is the data valuable in seeing these kinds of objects? The challenge in that is those, those platforms don't necessarily have the resolution you need. So if you remember the slide I put up there with the trends, the size of the objects we're looking for are typically reported to be one to four meters. Well, the resolution of many of the climate science, civil, um, science, you know, civil satellites is much larger than that, which means you'd have a hard time picking out something that's smaller than a pixel on the imagery on the data. That's not to say all of it's not useful and there are ways of pulling through that data and going through. That is what NASA is focused on right now. So what is, what are some other data sources that could be used? In addition, things like open source and um, um, crowdsourcing of, of data. We're exploring public-private partnerships. Ma'am, as you know, we've talked about in the past. Well, all we have to do is talk to, to Wynn Teach for an evening. Is there a way to what about, well, he, that's smartly what about the data he's got? crowdsource additional data that might be useful to augment some of my classified sources? And what does that look like? And how would we do it so that we're not overwhelmed by, you know, everybody who wants to take a picture of everything? Hmm. Like to tell the committee before we close? Or do you have another round? Yeah. Do you have anything else you'd like to tell the committee before we close? Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to come and share a little bit of insight into what Arrow is up to and what we're doing. I hope to be able to share a whole lot more in the future. Um, we words. have a lot of work to do, so if you don't... I hope you let me keep my job. It's because we've got a lot of work to do. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kirkpatrick. Thank you for the hearing. Thank you. Is that the end of it? All right.
Those I was just going to say, I thought this was a bit of a kebab fest, but look at who those guys at the back. Yeah, I think that's the end of it, isn't it? All right, then. Um, yeah, you see, I, I didn't mention that before, but there were those strange... There's those guys sitting at the back taking notes. I mean, who are they? Are they uh, are they part of the committee, or are they over, they're oversighting it, or are they are they they're supervisors of some kind from the intelligence community, from the CIA? All right, guys. Um, all right. So I think that's that's it. Um, but I'm not finished with the show yet. So there's a couple more things I want to look at. I'm just going to take a little break. So there'll be a. This is the end of my transmission, but um, obviously this is not live, so it won't be for the video. So. All right, guys, so I'm special. All going to want to know exactly what I thought of that and give you a full analysis. Um, I don't think I'm going to do that right now um, because I probably have to watch all that again. God, that'd be because <laughs> I like, nearly all of it was rather boring. Like I said, I could keep it up with the bureaucratic language is different. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I will um, confer with other commentators on this. I'll maybe watch a couple of reviews from other people to to solidify my thoughts on this. Uh, basically, because um, um, there are other people. I mean, I don't like to admit this, but there are other people within the UFO community more qualified at dissecting the bureaucracy of government than I am. I'm Steve Bassett is the obvious example of someone I can maybe watch. I could even email him and ask him what he thinks because he does communicate with me um, personally. It's, uh, you know, I think I was, on the whole, that wasn't all that good. I mean, I'm surprised. I mean, you see pictures from these committees and very often, I mean, there's a big table like that with all those chairs around it and there's chairs around the outside. And um, there doesn't seem to, there was, and there, of course, there's the seats where the public sit. And we, of course, we saw alien scientists sitting there. I'll show you. We'll go to alien scientists channel in a minute. I'm going to definitely put up a copyright disclaimer for this particular video, although, of course, it's all fair use. But um, he, I saw him sit sort of slouched on the left-hand side. Did you spot him? Yeah. Um, generally speaking, of course, there was just the three women at the other end of the table. I mean... Um, it's almost kind of a joke they have to sit at opposite ends. I mean, you think they could just like cuddle up a little bit, you know. Sean, come and sit here so we can speak to you more clearly, things like that. But of course, it all has to be done according to the book. So the the, the person being grilled that will has to answer to the Senate committee, they always sit at the other end of the table and things like that. It's probably some. It's not my sort of style, but obviously that's why I've never been a bureaucrat. I've never been in government. I've not even been a permanent senior porter. I've just been a. Um, I've just been acting, I've acted senior porter a couple of times, that's all. Um, but you know, there was, Scott, you see, people were quite pleased when they found out that Sean Kirkpatrick was going to be involved in Arrow because he he is quite good mates with Avi Loeb. I, mean, he, I get the sense he was having a bit of a go at him there. I mean, for example, one phrase sticks out in my mind, you know, science doesn't involve blogging and social media, things like that, which I think is unfair because, of course, sometimes it does. And then he's going on about speculation and stuff like that. And I think maybe he's having a bit of a go at Avi because Avi, as I say, Avi is the, I've got the, his full title, but he's basically Professor of Astron Astronomy Astrophysics at Harvard. Astronomy and Astrophysics. And it has a special title, his, his position. And he's spoken quite openly about how he thinks Oumuamua was an artificial extraterrestrial object. And he thinks there may be others out there. And he thinks we need to keep an eye out for them. And he's he's teamed up with uh, civilian ufologists. Oh, Lou Elizondo, of course. Um, he's as part of his project, got Galileo and things like that. They've got just got, they've managed to get a million dollars from Har from the Harvard dean. So that means that the the university is taking them seriously. So I can't help thinking that feeling that. Um, Kirkpatrick was was kind of like playing that down. He was trying not to pretend he wasn't a part of that, which I think is, is that dishonest or just good politics? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, God. Anyway, let's have a look. Alien Scientist, bless his sock, cotton socks. He was he did a live stream the other day saying, um, and he put out, he wanted people to run raise money to go there because he, he says, uh, what, I've got the thing he, he's put down. It's a bit all right. This is again. This is the copyright disclaimer, guys. I'll show you his channel um, here, 
alien scientist. I mean, I've covered this guy before. As more, I I have my problems with him. He's um, I think he's he's uh, he's he's a bitter, joyless individual. He's he's just he's very like Andrew Johnson. Interestingly, bitter, joyless, antagonistic, with um, you know, capable of antisocial behaviour. But his channel is his channel is very interesting. He is a proper scientist. He talks real science, and I do recommend his channel. There. Um, it, he says here he lives in Rhode Island. No, and where was it? Oh no, it wasn't here. He was saying somewhere that that was his interview with Brett Weinstein. He said somewhere on this, uh, somewhere on here, he said, "Oh, um, I, oh look, here's um." April 2020 UFO hearings in DC opening the Blue Room. All right, this is his preliminary, um, his preliminary video he wanted to do beforehand. What is up, YouTube? Oh, and he uh, he said here, I would like to travel from Rhode Island to DC. He lives in Rhode Island to attend the UFO hearings this coming Wednesday, but I don't currently have the funds. I would like to attend and hand out some copies of UFO science database on flash drives and business cards to the senator and congressman and other attendees. Well, he must have managed to do that. I mean, um, I don't have a problem with him doing that, actually. I, I don't have a problem with him handing out his material to the officials. I mean, I don't agree with everything he says. I think he's he's unfair and quite negative. He's, he's, very, he's, a, bit, he's a backslapper. He's another backslapper, basically. But he's got every right to put his side across. He also has a right to ask people to fund his journey. I mean, if you look on the map, um, the distance, if you're not familiar with the United States, it's quite a long way between Rhode Island and Washington, D.C. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, 150 miles, I think, something like that. It's quite a long way. And um, so people obviously gave him the money to go, which is great. That's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. Anyway, I might still share screen, screen sharing. Right. Um, let's have a look at his... Um, Oops. Let's have a look at his um, what he recorded. I'll, I'll have to watch that later privately, I think. Because let's have a look at what he's just recorded live at the U.S. at the Senate, live at the U.S. Senate UFO meeting. Here we go. We are here. The... Again, I'm claiming fair use on this. There'll be a um, disclaimer at the top. This is this is these are the people waiting to go in at the public. This is inside the Capitol building. People waiting to go into the, I suppose, waiting to go into that room where the hearing took place. Senate building. Outside of the Armed Services Committee hearing room entrance. What's on the topic for today? Room SVC 217, the office of... Senate. Oh, that's what it means. That's just the name of the room. I thought so earlier. Senate security in the Capitol Visitor Center. And room SR 232A in the Russell Senate office building. That's where we are right now, Wednesday, April 19th, 9.30 a.m. That's uh, just a couple minutes, right? It's 9.19, so we got 10 minutes. Witnesses are uh, Senator Sean Kirkpatrick, yes. the director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Arrow. And the hearing will be a closed session. The Office of the Senate Security and the Capitol Visitor Center at 9.30 a.m. There will be an open session immediately following the closed session. Okay, please. No, like this was discussed in that live stream I was watching on Witness Citizen. Is it significant they had the closed session first? Because, of course, with the House hearing last year, they had the public session first and then the closed session afterwards. I don't know if, I don't know if that means anything. Steve, Steve said it was both good and bad news. I don't know exactly what that means, but um, I'll look into that. On the line at, on your right, the door to the hearing will open at approximately 10.30 a.m. for the press and public. Witnesses and witness backups may... I would have gone along if I'd been in that area. I've never been to the United States, but if I'd been in that area, I'd have gone along. Come to SR228 and be escorted to the room. Oh, that's thank cool. you for grabbing. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, inside the house, Jeremy Corbell's not here. And ne neither is uh, Steve Bassett's not here. No, Steve Bassett is doing a live stream, isn't he? Jeremy Corbell's probably doing his. And, and, and of course, Jeremy doesn't get on with Corbell, Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy Reese doesn't get on with Jeremy Corbell. Look, he doesn't get on with most people. Gary Nolan. Stephen Bassett's in Los Angeles. Where's Ryan Graves? Is he coming? 
Well, Ron Wathit. Ryan Graves is the Ryan Graves is a pilot, and he's a, a main a principal witness for a tip, and um, he's been on a couple of TV shows. Oh, he's breaking and, up. Uh, we met we met a couple of friends, and uh, it's been a great conversation. But yeah, this guy here has been here since five a.m. Five a.m. Well, that's wow. that's commitment. Well, he thought it would. I thought it would fill up too. I thought there'd be way more people here trying to get in because there's only apparently there's only twenty seats. So that when this thing opens, there's only 20 seats available. Yeah, and, and most of them weren't full. Jeremy was in one of them. I think only about, about two thirds were full. So uh, there was not that many people there. So, we're going to be um, in those seats. Yes. We're going to be in those seats because there's, there's less than 20 people in line right now, right here. So, uh, hey guys, make sure to drop a like on this bad boy. The, got the, the bloke who got there at 5 a.m. must be kicking himself because he probably thought, I need to get there early to make sure I get a seat because there's going to be hundreds of people wanting to get in. And he gets there and finds there's plenty of room anyway. This it was not easy getting here. Yes. Yes. They, <laughs> I'm just kidding. They almost shut me down for that one. Um, <laughs> we're, we're here representing for the uh, the field and for the community uh, as someone who's researched this topic for the last two decades and can speak a lot about the uh, the topic. So what are we here to tell these people about today? So let me just tell you guys what I'm here to talk about today. Well, I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the technologies that aren't being talked about on the mainstream media. They're being completely out of this conversation altogether. I've spent the last... You know, of course, they're being... Yeah, that's true. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. And um, he, um, Jeremy Reese here does focus on, say, covert technologies, things like that, anti-gravity, stuff like that. And uh, a lot of it goes over my head, actually, because he's a trained scientist and he talks like... He talks the jargon, he talks the lingo. And... Um, some of it you you may not understand unless you are qualified like he is. Kurt J. Mungle's qualified too, and he talks a lot about proper science and stuff like that. But still, you know, I can pick up some things, and I find it very interesting. Like I said, though, this guy is difficult. He's a difficult person. He's a backslapper. He's often unfair. And um, yeah, he's. I um, think in the case of um, in the case of him and Andrew Johnson, I think it's the case of like poles repel. You know. <laughs> Last two decades as a physicist studying these technologies and trying to publish them out to the public, uh, interview the scientists who work on these, uh, these subjects, and uh, publish all that information in public domain in an effort to bring transparency and disclosure to this community, in addition to the debunking and, you know, sifting through the, the as well. To that the information that are being, you know, that that our senators end up getting is that is the most purest and um, important information that they need to, you know, know about to take action on this subject. Uh, one of the things that's important to me is uh, this issue of the blue room, and apparently there's a blue room at Wright Patterson Air Force Base that um, Senator Barry Goldwater. Yeah. Um, Irina Scott talks about the Blue Room around Wright Pat. That's where, that's Wright Pat. We know that the Roswell debris was taken to Wright Field, as it was called in those days. That's where the trail goes cold. So yeah, um, it's interesting. His other, his next video is called the Blue Room. Spoke about trying to get access to. Um, apparently, all the Roswell debris and debris from the Aztec and, and other crash sites that have occurred. Um, we're all brought to this one Air Force base at Wright Patterson and hidden underground in this uh, section. Yeah, I showed you about Irina Scott's book. I'm not going. It's over there. I'm not going to reach for it now. But it's called Sacred Corridors. I very much recommended it. I've interviewed Irina a couple of times. Very interesting stuff. Called the Blue Room, and Senator Barry Goldwater knew about this. He tried to get access to this. Apparently, um, they used some metallurgy contractors, and according to J. Allen Hynix. The interesting about Barry Goldwater, um, yeah, he he was he actually ran for president once. And of course, if you read my book, Roswell Rising: A Novel of Disclosure, available at all good bookshops now, price ten pounds, you'll know that um, in my fictional scenario, Goldwater actually does become president in this particular um, scenario in my in my imaginary alt alternate history in that story. Notes which Jack Fillay found a, a memo called the Pentacle Memorandum. And J. Allen Hynek was the scientist who headed the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book UFO investigation back in the 1950s. And apparently there was a second Project Blue Book which handled specifically the metals 
side of, uh, of the topic and was given access to materials and other things that weren't give, that weren't um, given to the uh, rest of the public. So um, those apparently went to a, uh, an institute called Battelle Memorial Institute. Um, and Battelle is, uh, is interesting in all this because they currently manage all of our national laboratories. So they have contracts at all of our... Again, Dr. S Dr. Irina Scott s spent much of her career at Battelle and the right part. So she was involved in this. You know, things like angel hair and the metamaterials we've talked about, yeah. National labs and... Yeah, I can't, I can't move around too much, so my connection might be spotty. And, um, let me go near the window. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody here right now, so... So I'm hoping to get it studied this stuff and knows more than the people currently in the media and everywhere else talking about this subject. Yeah, we're out here. There's the Capitol. Nice view. Um, beautiful building here, guys. So um, awesome. I got $2 for grifting already. $2.47 I've made off my, my grift. Oh, one pound uh, nine thank nine. you, guys. <laughs> Thank you guys Dave's for the support. House. David, Dave's at Waffle House. Dave's Waffle House, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't originally, I thought I wasn't going to be able to come. It was just too tight on the schedule and a little tight on money. It's really, it's, everything's super expensive down here. So um, it, we paid like, it was like $100 for dinner, for breakfast or something. It was, it was ridiculous. Uh, so we're here. I made it down and I'm standing in line right now. We're the only people in line, so I think we'll have a problem getting into this conference now if we just stay in line and maintain that position. So for another hour till 1030, we'll be let in. And hopefully I get up there to ask some questions about Battelle, the Blue Room, um, Wright Patterson, uh, these questions. Of course, they didn't take any, they didn't unfortunately take any questions from the public the, the public gallery was not permitted to speak as the governmental organizations which seem to have uh, power over the government uh, unwarranted un over no oversight and um power into this this topic that yeah like, like i said i sensed that i sensed that kirkpatrick was being influenced by somebody else the way he, he sort of started hesitating his speech slowed down as certain subjects came up, especially when he was edging to that area where he's going to have to say, well, look, if then are they foreign adversary? No, there's no evidence. And he, was, he started off using very confusing language and gobbledygook and stuff like that. It's possible that, uh, you know, um, Kirsten Gillibrand is not involved with whatever organization he's taking orders from. He's taking orders direct from the deep state. Like I said, it's possible the White Hats now are in control of the truth embargo. So I'm just checking that I've had to down my, uh, that's the previous bit I was recording is downloaded. That's a long segment, that is. And um, and we've you've got like, uh, yep, yeah, it's all there. And, um, you know, it could be that she's a white hat. She knows this, or she might be completely out of the loop. In which case, that, what we've just seen, was just a, a sham. And, of course, it was disappointing he didn't talk more because, about the stuff he'd worked with with Avi Loeb, the paper he co-authored with Avi Loeb. Um, that the pub, the, even the government doesn't have access to this, sub, this subject. It's immune from FOIA requests and it's locked away inside these quasi-governmental organizations. And we're here to um, bang down the door and, you know, politely, so to speak, not, you know, shaman style, not January 6th style. Um, we're, we're here to... Oh, don't start me on January the 6th. Uh come here and yeah and there was cockroaches down the mall underneath the, the hilton hotel here man it was pretty nasty it's a uh, giant cockroach too a big big sucker um but yeah i anticipate them saying nothing and probably not answering my questions in fact most of my questions i, I expect to have been answered or be answered in the closed uh classified section of the the um because of the technologies and stuff like that but I, I, we, we are here it would be tempting to sort of slip inside, wouldn't it, and sort of see if you can sneak in, gate crash, hide under the table or something when no one's looking. <laughs> that was good. That was interesting. All right. Well, thanks uh, for that, Jeremy. Um, there's nothing really, there's not a lot I can add now. There's not a lot I can add now.
kind of this has all been my purpose of this video is simply to provide commentary on that particular on that on that particular hearing now it's really what we're going to see now is we're going to see a lot of commentary from people not just from me everyone's going to be given an assessment of what happened there's going to be a, a massive post-mortem it's and um if that's not a bit of a dismal word way of putting it and there's probably going to be some more videos soon what i'll have to do is i'll probably have to go away analyze what has just happened here um you know confer with the community and then maybe we can do a live stream where I can we basically we can just talk about i can talk about with you the viewers about what's happened here i think that's the best thing um so uh i did i did wonder if i'd have to and of course i think there's gonna have to be a live stream in the next couple of days maybe friday um i'm not sure i can do saturday friday or sunday um uh, but i will i'll organize a live stream for us okay all right so um yep that's it that is the senate hearing over with it was some people speculate it might go on for two and a half hours or something it was what was it three quarters of an hour something like that nothing uh anyway thank you all of you for watching hapanwo tv you'll be hearing me for very soon on the ufo subject as well as many many other subjects hospital porters pride and dignity stop the new world order